Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council, Mayor Skip Henderson, City Manager Isaiah Hughley, Pops Barnes, District 1, Glenn Davis, District 2, Bruce Huff, District 3, Evelyn Turner Pugh, Mayor Pro Tem and District 4, Charmaine Crabb, District 5. Gary Allen, District 6. Mimi Woodson, District 7. Walker Garrett, District 8. Judy Thomas, Post 9 at Large Counselor. John House, Post 10 at Large Counselor. Sandra Davis, Clerk of Council and City Attorney Clifton Fay. Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. ...edition of the uh, City Council meeting, and we're glad to have you all with us. Uh, we're going to begin, as we always do, by asking God's blessings uh, on these proceedings. And I'm going to ask Pastor Jeff uh, Strucker? Strucker. Strucker. Uh, from Calvary Baptist to uh, to uh, come forward and, and return thanks for us. Sure. Let's say a prayer together. Father, I think it's a great privilege to live in this community, and it's not the Chattahoochee River, it's not the pine trees, it's not the business, it's the people of this town. And so thank you, Father, for the men and women that are in this city council that uh, lead us. Pray that tonight you will give them wisdom, maybe even give them a little healthy fear to remember that the decisions that they make will affect the generation that's sitting in this room that will grow up and inherit this community. God bless this meeting tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Pastor, thank you so much, and please thank your congregation for sharing you with us tonight. Thank you. All right, and next up, this amazing group of young folks from, uh, from Double Churches Elementary is going to come forward and lead us in our pledge. If y'all want to come forward. Everybody, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm Caroline Kelly. I'm in fifth grade, and my teacher is Miss Whiteley. Hello, my name's Lonnie. My, hello, my name's Lonnie. Um, I'm in third grade, and my teacher is Dr. Ball. Hello, my name is Taylor. I'm in third grade, and my. Can we check check the microphone? Don't want to miss those names. Hello, my name is Taylor and I'm in third grade and my teacher's name is Miss Williamson. Hello, my name is Ronald. Uh, I'm in fifth grade and my teacher's Miss Bradford. Hello, my name is Joy Lamar and I'm in second grade and my teacher's is Miss Seymour. I'm Ava Wallace. My, I'm in second grade and my teacher is Miss Seymour. My name is Molly Wasik. I'm seven years old and I I am second grade and my teacher's name is Miss Seymour. Hello, my name is Riley, and um, I am in first grade, and my teacher's name is Dr. Sinks. Hello, my name is Margaret, and I'm um, pre-K, Mr. Well and Miss Davis's pre-K class. Hello, my name is Madeline. I'm in first grade and I'm homeschooled. Hello, my name is Olivia and I'm in kindergarten. My teacher's name is Miss Coop. Hi, my name is Jason and I'm in fourth grade and my teacher's name is Miss LeVan. 
Hi, my name is Tommy Nellis. I'm in fourth grade, and my teacher is Miss LeVan. Hello, my name is Jimmy Gore. Um, I'm in second grade, my, and my teacher is Miss Mitchell. Hello, my name is Haley, and I am in second grade, and my teacher's name is Miss Mitchell. Hi, my name is Salima, second grader. And what? Miss Woods. Double touches. My name is Bo, and I'm in. I, I am in kindergarten. Mama, and my teacher's name is Miss Coop. Hi, I'm Harrison Maddox, and my teacher's name is Miss Mitchell, and I'm seven years old. Hi, my name is Cody, and I'm I'm in and I'm in um, kindergarten, and um kindergarten, and my and my teacher's name is Miss Black. Hi, my name is Morgan Collins, and I am seven years old, and my teacher's name is Miss Mitchell. Hi, my name is Brianna Richardson, and I'm in third grade, and my teacher's name is Miss Hagen. Um, my, name, my name is Parker, and I'm seven years old. My teacher's name is Miss, Saint, is Miss Seymour. My name is Lazarus Baggins. I'm in fourth grade, and my teacher's name is Miss Norris. My name is Bailey Calibre, and I'm in third grade Miss, in Miss Hagen's class. Hi, my name is Zarian Henderson. I'm in third grade, and I'm in Mrs. Hagen's class. Hi, my name's Braxton Van Vliet, and I'm in second grade Miss Seymour's class. Hi, my name's Bill, and I'm in Mrs. Cooper's class, and I'm in kindergarten. Hi, my, my name is Landon, and I'm in third grade, and I'm in, and I'm in Ms. Hagen's class. Hi, my name is Addie Robinson, and I'm nine years old in Ms. Mahaney's class, fourth grade. Hi, my name is Riley Scruggs. I am nine years old in fourth grade in Miss LeVant's class. My name is Braylon, and I'm in th third grade, and my teacher is Miss Carnley. And ladies, why don't you give us your names? You don't have to give us your age. <laughs> We're not giving ages, I'm sorry. I'm Lori Valentini, I'm the assistant principal at Double Churches Elementary. Hi, I'm Jessica Thorne, the elementary dean of Double Churches Elementary. Well, I'll tell you something. You guys did an amazing job. Give them a hand if you don't mind. <laughs> we have, uh, I, we, I know they didn't get this great by themselves, so we have parents in the audience. If you would stand, or if you're already standing, raise your hand. Let us recognize you. Thank y'all very much. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, that was awesome. We'll, uh, we'll let them exit. Let's sign a few autographs. I tell you, that's a uh, that's a room full of cute right there. That's a 
We're, we always appreciate our, uh, our school-aged children to come and lead us in our pledge. I think some of them are still leading us in our pledge. All right, I um, have one announcement to make on the mayor's agenda, and that is that uh, the Census 2020 kickoff meeting will be held uh, next Wednesday, March 6th, at 10.30 in the morning at the uh, library. And I would urge you, anybody that has the slightest bit of interest, uh, please attend. Uh, it is it's so critical that we get as close to an accurate count as possible. Um, a lot of our federal dollars are determined by uh, the number of people living in our community. And, and we also want to make sure that we have an accurate count because that's how, that's how congressional districts and council districts and school, uh, school board districts are de decided. And we want to make sure that everybody has the same fair representation across the board. So uh, if anybody asks you for your assistance with the census, please help them out. Uh, and don't forget, we'll, we will notify you again. Uh, we'll have a proclamation meeting next week, and at that, at that time, we'll remind you about the meeting that will be the following day on the, uh, the complete count meeting. Uh, next up, we, uh, we have a uh, presentation by our, our internal auditor who is going to report his findings uh, on, a, uh, on an audit just recently completed. Mr. Redmond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Manager, Mr. Attorney. Tonight I'm going to uh, give you a report on an investigation of a whistleblower case. Now this is a bit out of the ordinary because whistleblower, we follow the state laws regarding the whistleblower program and we don't normally reveal the complainant. We don't normally uh, discuss the outcome publicly. But because this particular complaint was made publicly at this forum, on September the 11th and then again in January of this year, I felt it compelled that we should uh, present the response to it publicly as well. As I said earlier, the complaint complainant appeared on both the September uh, 11th and the January 22nd council meetings public agenda and uh, made some complaints regarding the crime prevention grant that was made to Georgia Appleseed, in particular their local organization. Thank you. Uh, the complaint uh, surrounded the contractual obligation not being completed, the key operative quitting because he was tired of being on the road, the program not effective in stopping out of school suspensions, that the school to prison pipeline still exists and that uh, there was a conflict of interest between a board member and then Mayor Teresa Tomlinson. Uh, I received a request from the former Mayor Tomlinson to perform the investigation and I requested at that time that the response would be made public as it was the complaint was made in public. Our investigative process that I followed, I, I reviewed the crime prevention program files as it related to the grantee, I reviewed videos of the September 11, 2018 and the January 22, 2019 City Council meetings and reviewed information presented and or provided by the complainant and consulted with the city attorney on alleged conflict of interest issues. I also considered some extraneous factors that I felt uh, have a bearing on the outcome or success of the program since that was one of the things that was challenged by the complainant. One thing that's not really considered in it is the attrition of educators and administrators due to promotions, transfers, and retirements. So the staff of the school changes a bit from year to year, some years more than others. There's also attrition of students due to transfers and graduation. There's also changes in the volume or number of, of students enrolled in the school. And there's also a change sometimes the level of support in a particular school is, con is due to conflicting objectives. It would seem that it would always be that the administration and the teachers would be excited about a program that would help keep students in school, particularly at risk of troubled students. But you have to consider that their goals 
or educating students. It's improving test scores, standardized tests, SAT scores, ACT, all of those types of things. And if you have a student that's disrupting the class, it makes it more difficult to teach and to cover all the material. So those are all some uh, things that can uh, be effective on the outcome of the program. I looked at the grant process, reviewing the grant application, the award of the grant by the Crime Prevention Board, the execution of the contract by the grantee and city officials, the grantee submission of required documentation, and disbursement of funds monthly, and the grantee's monthly activity report. All of these I found to be very thorough and complete as I was reviewing. Everything was properly executed, contracts, now the grantee has some key responsibilities and obviously the whole program is about stopping the school to the prison pipeline and the primary purpose of this program is to reduce the out of school suspensions as a mean to help stop that school to prison pipeline. The first and key element of the program was to conduct positive behavioral intervention and supports so or PBIS training to the educators and administrators. And in doing that, uh, the school district actually decided to determine their academic officer and I suppose the superintendent determined which schools would be included in the training and which ones would not. And I'll show you in a minute why some would not be included. You might say, well, why didn't they just do them all? Well, we, got, we have some schools that have virtually no suspensions out of school. Uh, a couple of the high schools are that way and certainly many of the elementary schools are in that category. And it's just really not cost effective to bring those people in and train them when they don't have a problem to begin with. The PBIS training was provided to educators and administrators during the 2016 and 17 and then the 2017-18 school years. Uh, Mr. Teddy Reese was the operative for George Appleseed in the local program here. Uh, he attended and led numerous meetings of programs sponsored by the schools, community, and, the, and constituting most of his on-the-road activity. So he was on the road all right, but he was on the road around town, as much as many of our city officials are, as we have frequently have meetings and we try to reach out to as many people as we can. And he was doing the same related to the communities where he was serving. Uh, he also provided the monthly reports detailing the activities performed, and they were submitted as required to the crime prevention director each month. Now, I might add that in the beginning, those reports were only required on a quarterly basis, and actually, George Appleseed was the first to suggest moving to a monthly reporting schedule, and so that began uh, several years back. Uh, we looked at the grant funding and how it was spent. It was spent locally for the compensation of the local staff member and program supplies. Uh, and, it, you know, it was a committed, uh, the community also really benefited from the efforts of Georgia Appleseed, particularly the state office and, and all of the support, all of the attorneys that they have not only on their board, but pro bono attorneys that helped to reshape the juvenile justice system in the state of Georgia. Now, you might say, well, what are you talking about? How do they reshape it? And, and Mr. Reese was doing that locally, coordinating with the local juvenile courts and, and uh, staff that worked with it and attorneys. What they attempted to do was to remove nonviolent student offenses from going to, through the juvenile court and let the time be expended on the ones that were violent issues. By doing that, it took a lot of the people out of the court system, and if they don't go to court, they're not going to prison. School administrators, the city manager, the mayor, they don't send people to prison. So if you don't go to court, it's not likely that the student's going to end up going to prison. So that helps to get them back in the program. The PPIS training is designed to create really a code of, of conduct for the schools and to, get, and to train and teach that like it's a class, in the, you know, for the, so the teachers can teach it once they've been instructed on it. And that being said, it really leads to having a better behavioral process in the entire school. Uh, the 
findings as we continue, there was no conflict of interest in Mr. Tomlinson serving on the board of directors of Georgia Appleseed and Mrs. Tomlinson serving as the mayor of the Columbus as there was no financial benefit to either party. That comes from the city attorney. I'm not making the rules. There is, in a, there is inadequate post-training results to assess the success or failure of PBIS training. I mean, it was just two years of it was just completed the last school year. We're only two-thirds of the way through the next school year, so it's very difficult to even begin to really evaluate it ongoing. Now, we do know what the differences were between year one of training and year two. And many of the schools, or most of the schools that were in year one also went back for training in year two, but additional ones were added. But I will say this. Some schools showed remarkable improvement in one year period. Midland Middle School dropped from 53 suspensions to four in between one year and the next. On the other hand, there were some schools that they actually increased a few. So it's not, you know, you just don't see it that quickly. I think it takes a while for this to permeate and be spread throughout the school with the, once the teachers and the administrators are trained. And based on our view, Georgia Appleseed satisfied all the requirements of the grant awarded by the Crime Prevention Program. Uh, are there any questions? If you have any, I'd be happy to entertain them at this time. Any questions from Council? I know we've got a couple of individuals that wish to speak to this in a few minutes when we get to the public agenda. So we, if you wouldn't mind, stick around. We may sure. have some questions we ask you to answer to. that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Redman. Okay. All right, next up is approval of the minutes. Second. Motion second, approve the minutes. Any uh, revisions, any, any additions to the minutes? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Minutes passed. The city attorney, it's your agenda. Hit you, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We just have some votes to take this evening on some zoning matters and a couple of other uh, minor resolutions. The first item up is property at 3707 Second Avenue. So going to RO Residential Office, it's ready for action. Second. Motion second to approve. Any discussion? Chris, can you cue the vote? Please enter your votes. It passes. All right, Mr. Krieg, thank you for being here. Next item is the property at 1429 Morris Road. It's going to General Commercial. Mr. Flournoy is ready for adoption. Okay. Motion to second to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor, we'll, we'll queue it up. Please hit green. Any opposed, hit red. And it passes, nine to nine. All right. Next item is the amendment to the UDO Table 3.1.1 for clubs not for profit in a residential zone as a special exception use. That's ready for approval. Second. All right, there is a motion and a second to approve. Uh, any discussion? All right, please cue the vote. And it passes 90 nothing. All right. Item four is the fiscal year 2019 uh, mid-year amendment, and it is now ready for adoption. Second. Motion second to approve. Uh, any discussion? Please cue the vote. All in favor, press green. Any opposed, red. It passes nine yes. to nine. Item five is the assistant chief deputy clerk, superior court, Pay grade change to 18H. Second. Motion second to approve. Uh, any discussion? Please cue the vote. All in favor? Please enter your votes. Passes nine to nothing. All right. Thank you, Clerk Forte, for being here. Thank you, ma'am. Next item is amending 4 3 2 of the city code to allow the Columbus Recreation Advisory Board to meet at least bi-monthly. Ready for approval. Motion second to approve. Any discussion? Please cue the vote. All in favor, press green. It passes nine to nothing. All 
All right. Item seven is the procurement ordinance amendment for Metra as a result of federal audit that is ready for adoption. There's a motion and a second to uh, approve. Any discussion on the motion? Please cue the vote. All in favor, enter your votes. Any opposed, do likewise. Looks like we're missing one. Okay. Got everybody? There we go. Passes nine to nothing. Thank you, sir. All right. Now that the UDO has changed, we have a vote for a special exception use. Let's see if anybody wants to be heard. 3835 Forest Road for club or lodge. Anybody in the audience, the petitioner? Mr. Flournoy is here. I don't see any other questions. All right, that is ready for a vote, Mayor. Okay. We got a motion and a second to approve a special exception. Any uh, discussion? Please cue the vote. All in favor? Please enter your vote. Opposed, likewise. And it passes nine to nothing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Barnoy. Next item is a resolution approving a pool for recorder's court. This is five names for recorder pro tem. For the next four-year term, they'll be used on an as-needed basis and paid uh, per session. Councillor Thomas, want to comment? Yes, uh, she does. Let me get her turned on there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, the... Um, um, Recorder's Court Committee met with uh, Judge Hunter um, the last couple of days and um, developed this list of names. I think you have it in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. If not, um, Go ahead, um, we are requesting that you appoint uh, Cynthia Masano Griffin, Susan Henderson, Bob Watkins Sr., Jennifer Cooley, and Tracy Green Corville as recorders pro tem. Uh, and what that, the way that will work is the judge, um, Judge Hunter is the full-time um, judge, of course, and holds most of the courts. But he can call on any one of these five to do additional court, for example, uh, Saturday court or the environmental court, that sort of thing. <clears throat> they only are paid when they, uh, actually are holding court and I believe if I remember it's like hundred and fifty dollars a session or something like that they do they will have to have um, have to go to the training that all um, uh, judges of this type have to take state training uh, at this point there's not nothing in the recorders court budget uh, to cover that uh, but we will have to see either to rearrange something that's in the budget or we may have to come back to you to ask for additional funding. None of these five, let me back up. Um, Ms. Griffin may have served she as has. a judge at one time. I think she did. She may have had some of this training. The others of them have not. I think Masano may have. That's Griffin. Oh, okay. Griffin. Yeah. That's yeah. her new name? She, she has time. had some training. I'm not sure how often it has to uh, be renewed or whatever. So we may be coming back to you um, at a later date for um, uh, budgetary, but they have to have the training. So we'll have to come back to you at that point. So um, having said all of that, I move approval of the resolution. Motion second to accept that slate offered up as uh, part-time recorder's court judges. And uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I've been told that it's about, we're, we're talking about se about $7,000. Okay. Thank you. All right, there is a motion second. Is there any discussion to the motion? All right, uh, do we have that queued, Bruce? All right, please enter your vote. Uh, okay, that has passed. Passes 10 to nothing. Thank you, and Mayor, our last Official item tonight is asking the local legislative delegation to the General Assembly to introduce legislation to clarify that Chapter 4 of Title 36, those requirements are not applicable to consolidated governments. As many of you know that study Georgia history, about a 
150 years ago, the Georgia General Assembly looked at where county sites and county courthouses were located. But there are there is a set of statutes that govern uh, any moving or relocating of the official county site, and we simply ask for clarification that that not apply to consolidated governments here. And, and the city attorney brought this to my attention, and I have contacted some of you. Some of you I have not been able to reach, but uh, mm -hmm. as he mentioned, this is this is just something that we need to clean up as we move forward with deciding what we're going to do with the uh, with the government center, uh, just so that there's no no confusion if, in fact, it is decided that at some point part or all of the construction will take place off off the site where it now sits. So, and I, I still have to get in touch with a couple of the legislative, uh, uh, some of our legislative delegation just to let them know it's coming. Uh, but it's kind of, I guess we need to get this taken care of, this house cle housekeeping measure done uh, ahead of time so we don't run into problems later. That's right. Any, it, we do have a it, question. Okay. Councillor Crabb. So are we getting clarification on site versus seat? I mean. I don't know if they use this terminology here, but in Nebraska, where I grew up, uh -huh. the county seat was the site was the city where, you know, and so we are technically a county seat. Well, we're well, one city, one county. Right. So it doesn't. It so doesn't I mean, apply. so yeah. or are we talking about a specific location within the city? Is that what we're getting clarification on? Uh, this is dealing with county site. Historically, under Georgia law, this, this law goes back to the 1800s, but the county site was the actual physical location of the Within courthouse. Within the city. Right, and okay. if that was moved to another town in the county, you had to go through these hoops, including a petition and referendum. But right. a consolidated government, of course, there's no need to do that if you're only talking about one county and one government, one unified government. So really all we're getting is clarification that that's, that's right. how we're interpreting it. Correct. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, would you cue it, Bruce? Please register your vote. <clears throat> and that has passed. It has. Mm -hmm. That's all we had listed, Mayor. Hmm? Oh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. I thought we did. Councilor Thomas made the motion, motion. I believe, and I think I thought uh, we had a second. I apologize. All right. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me straight. And that's all we had listed, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and. Uh, Next up, we have our public agenda. And I'm told that um, Ms. Avis Lewis, Mama Love, was unable to be here this evening, so we'll move to the uh, next on the agenda, and that's Ms. Teresa Elamine uh, speaking reference to Georgia Appleseed Crime Prevention Grant and the audit. Uh, and Ms. Ms. Elamine, there's we've change the time limits it's five minutes oh yeah i did and call I, ahead and i was told so okay. i am prepared all right well welcome. Uh, that's Please. why i put my comments in writing and i emailed them to you earlier today i, I did see it i saw it right and i will that. read them for the record okay as well it, it will not take five state, minutes that's fine state your name and your address oh, please, ma'am. teresa alamine 3911 steam mill road and i do have 22 handouts so that everybody has uh, what i'm going to be talking about. Well, first of all, I think that was a scandalous whitewash from the internal auditor. I started working with the school district on the school to prison pipeline in 2011. Georgia Appleseed called me and I invited them in. They did all kinds of public events about the out of school suspensions. The school district has resisted eliminating the out-of-school suspensions. And that's why I thought that Georgia Appleseed was going to represent the students in that process to try to stop so many of the out-of-school suspensions, because that's what lawyers do, and they are lawyers. So I'll just read my total complaint for the public. My complaint summary. 
my objective for filing the complaint about crime prevention grants to Georgia Appleseed is to seek corrective action on practices inside the Crime Prevention Department that are overly subjective and unethical. It was common knowledge that Tripp Tomlinson, Mayor Teresa Tomlinson's spouse, was on the board of Georgia Appleseed when Georgia Appleseed began receiving crime prevention funds. Tripp Tomlinson remained on the Georgia Appleseed board until 2016. Perhaps it was coincidental that 2016 was the last year Georgia Appleseed applied for funding. At the end of that last year of crime prevention funding, Georgia Appleseed pulled out of Columbus completely in June 2017. Georgia Appleseed staff associated with crime prevention funding resigned in June 2017 or announced their plans uh, to leave. Sharon Hill, who signed the contract, which clearly stated the contract was for personnel and office supplies. Strict overhead is the contract that you all voted for in 2016. It's clear. I gave you a copy of it. Sharon Hill, the principal officer and signer on all the crime prevention contracts, told me her plans to move on at a meeting on June 7, 2017 when we were in Macon, Georgia at a meeting because I was working with Georgia Appleseed. And I know that Mr. Wells, hopefully he's here, uh, he had nothing to do with any of this. And I'm hoping to build a relationship with Georgia Appleseed so that they can do what I know they're capable of doing to support ending the school to prison pipeline. I complained directly to Sharon Hill because they took over $387,000 over four years of our tax dollars, sales tax dollars. That's what they did. And what they should have known is that the school district is resistant. So the objective reality is the school district will not do what Georgia Appleseed was trying to get them to do. They should have quit long ago because that objective reality was there. I have given you reports of the out-of-school suspensions, and the person who was here talking about it, it is a process that I worked on in 2004 in Durham. They didn't start the process here to 2014, and they add 10 schools each year. They still don't have all the schools in the program, and I have been struggling with them over that, and I went to all of the meetings all of the meetings. So I'll read my corrective action for the record. What I'm proposing is that Crime Prevention Department create clear conflict of interest guidelines and have all Crime Prevention Board members complete and sign annually stating their employer, who pays them, and all affiliations with nonprofits. Crime Prevention Board members must recuse themselves on grants. So if your best friend is uh, getting a grant, you should not vote on it. And Mr. House, if our grant gets that far and it comes up this year, you would recuse yourself. You would recuse yourself because that's the way it should be. So you have the other items here. And I have given a copy uh, to folks, and I'll give a copy to Mr. Wells. But I'm trying to correct the problems in the department that we know aren't right. And I hear the city's attorney's opinion uh, but you want to remove any appearance of impropriety and having your husband on the board and you're giving out on the mayor's agenda almost $400,000 is a problem. Thank you, Ms. Elamie. It's a problem. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Hang on. We've... Mayor Pro Tem. For clarification, there is nothing that prohibits a spouse of an elected official from serving on the board. Ms. Elamine, I'm sorry there's no rebuttal. Oh, oh, I, oh she doesn't have a question for me. No, ma'am. But okay. thank you, though. I'm sorry. No, there is not. And in fact, the internal auditor checked with our office to make sure there was no service by both the former mayor and 
the mayor's spouse, and there was not. In fact, the mayor's spouse at one time was on the state board, but the mayor, mayor Tomlinson, former mayor, was not on the board, and there was no financial interest and no conflict of interest. Uh, and that's what we look at under our conflict rules for any board member dealing with any elected official here. So there was not a conflict of interest under our charter. Is that all, ma'am? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, next on, on our agenda is uh, Mr. Tally Wells uh, speaking to crime prevention grants to Georgia Appleseed. Sir, we have a five-minute uh, limit yes, on sir. comments, and we'll start it after you uh, give your name and your address. Thank you, Mr. Mayor um, and council members. My name is Tally Wells. I do not have the good fortune of living in Columbus, but I live at 398 Ormond Street, Southeast Atlanta, Georgia. I am... Uh, I've been the executive director of Georgia Appleseed uh, Center for Law and Justice since uh, January 1st, 2018. So I did not, um, again, have the good fortune to overlap with um, the work uh, that was done here in Columbus. But uh, Georgia Appleseed is extremely proud of that work. And um, based on um, the complaint made uh, by Ms. Elamine, um, I had the opportunity to, to research. And now I am even more proud of the work Georgia Appleseed did in Columbus, Georgia, and specifically the work that Teddy Reese did. On the way here, I spoke with Mr. Reese and asked him to name five schools that he worked very closely with in the Muskogee County School District. He named off the top of his head Rothschild, Carver, Kendrick, Brewer, and Baker. I looked up um, each of these schools. Each of these schools, the out-of-school suspension rate has dropped from uh, 2014 to the present, Rothschild 23% to 21%. Carver um, has gone down from 25% to 12.8%. Kendrick dropped from 27% to 25%. Brewer 12% to 7%. And Baker 51% to 42%. Um, Mr. Reese had over 100 meetings across Columbus as part of this grant, public meetings with the schools, with um, community leaders, and um, really uh, gave the charge of how PBIS could impact schools in Columbus. And um, for those schools that embrace PBIS, there has been significant improvement. Mr. Reese also and uh, Georgia Appleseed worked with the Columbus School District, or the Muskogee School District, to apply for a Project AWARE mental health grant from the United States government, uh, which Muskogee was one of only three school districts in the state to get that grant. It was a $2.5 million grant, and um, Project AWARE has been in, um, in place uh, since, since that time, and I think 2015, it may be 2014, um, uh, which is focused on behavioral health, mental health services for children in Columbus schools. And I know because I come from a background of mental health advocacy how important those Project AWARE grants are and what a difference they're making in Muskogee and Newton and Griffin Spalding, which are the three school districts. And they really have been the springboard for a transformation across this state of getting behavioral health services into schools and students. And Governor Deal um, embraced school-based behavioral health, and Governor Kemp has now asked for $8.3 million to go to school-based mental health services in this legislative session. There are a lot of incredible benefits that are happening across this state that in part started with seeds planted here in Columbus. We also created a toolkit so that you can go to Georgia Appleseed's website and look at every school in Muskogee County School District and look at the out-of-school suspension rates for the last 10 years. You can look at um, it by race, by gender, by special education status, and um, monitor uh, how the schools are doing yourself. And that's something that Teddy worked with uh, local citizens throughout Muskogee County to make sure that citizens knew how they can be looking at how particular schools were doing in this area. 
Um, as Mr. Redmond said, um, we also uh, did a lot of the research for a uh, reform of the juvenile code here and learned a lot from Muskogee, built a very close relationship, and ultimately um, worked with uh, Governor Deal to get um, a, a, a complete rewrite of the juvenile code uh, passed through the legislature, and it pla passed unanimously. And we are so grateful for the, for the work and what happened here in Muskogee County. We recently did an assessment of how the code's doing five years into it, and um, it, it's not surprising results. It essentially said that for those um, districts that really invested in the juvenile code reform, it's making a huge difference. But it's all about sort of the interventions and services and supports you can provide to children. And um, our work here um, has been a springboard for this state, but also for this community. We're very proud of it. I, I encourage you to go, both go to our website, Georgia Appleseed's website, and also go to the governor's K through 12 dashboard and really monitor um, how the schools are doing on out of school suspensions. But um, we're proud. We're proud of the work we've done in Columbus, and we're grateful for the opportunity to talk about that work. Thank you. Mr. Wells, thank you, and thank you for making the trip down here to join us this evening. We, we appreciate your, your time. All right, and that's, uh, that's it for the public agenda. Oh, hang on just a second. We've got, uh, first we have uh, Councillor Davis. Just two things, and just hearing and trying to understand this over time. I think that maybe, uh, as it relates to a school district, we might need to review these matters a little bit more uh, in the future. Uh, this is not, that's not what we do, but uh, possibly review these, uh, these programs a little better uh, and certainly get them, gain their approval on them. The second thing is the, uh, Ms. Elamine brought a recommendation. I'd like to have that uh, read into the record or recommendation and a copy of that forwarded to the uh, Director of Crime Prevention. Uh, where they can take that matter up. I think it's a great, I think it's a, a pretty solid recommendation because we, this body I know, uh, Councilor Thomas, you know, we worked almost a year dealing with this to get a structure in place of accountability and, uh, and, and what I heard her say is just adding to it. So I don't see it hurting. Uh, I see it as a, as a very uh, positive recommendation and should be looked at and reviewed. And if we don't do it already, if it's not being done, then maybe look how to how to blend it or to uh, uh, to incorporate it into um, uh, the structure as it is the accountability structure. And I'm I'm sure the our city auditor will um, make sure that that recommendation is uh, uh, looked at closely as well. All right, thank you. And I you know I think um, there's absolutely as the uh, as our city attorney meant made note, there, there's no indication at all of, of any conflict of interest. However, Ms. Selamine does bring up a good point, and since the counselor has asked that we pass that on, I think it, you know, just to maintain all semblance of propriety so that we're above question uh, in the future, I think it's a very valid request coming from Ms. Alamine through a counselor, so uh, Mr. Brown is here and he will take that back to the board as a recommendation. All right, any other comments? Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first on my agenda, I have a Columbus Police Department uh, fiscal year 19 <coughs> request for reallocation of budgeted funds. All right, we've got a motion second. Uh, any, any discussion on to the motion? All right, would you please cue it up for vote? Please, any votes? And that passes unanimously. Uh, next, Mr. Mayor, I've got a uh, $67,989.60 grant with no match for Bright from the Start uh, from the Georgia Department of Early Child Care and Learning. Um, motion second to approve the grant Bright from the Start. Uh, any any discussion, any comments to the motion? No. All right, Councillor uh, Thomas. Mr. City Manager, this is to be um, administered through the um, 
Parks and Rec, and it's for it offers nutritional snacks daily to youth enrolled in the before and after school programs. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We do have a motion and a second. Uh, any other discussion? All right. If you would please cue the vote. Please enter your votes. It passes unanimously. Got donation of bleacher covers uh, by Northern Little League. The value is seven thousand dollars. Got a motion and a second. Um, any any questions or any comments to the motion? All right. Please cue the vote. Please enter your vote. Yes, we'll send them a note saying they can put the covers on there. All right, it passed unanimously. Mr. Mayor, we're asking uh, for approval to submit an application and accept $8,704 at no cost to the city for CAPS Maximus, Maximus funding for the after school program. We'll Motion second to approve. Any uh, discussion? Please cue the vote. Please register your votes. And it passes unanimously. Whoop. There we go. Now it's unanimous. Next, uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got uh, mortgagees, uh, landlord subordination agreement. Um, we're asking you to um, approve um, signing the agreement for the Sports Council to pay for the installation of lighting at South Common Softball com Complex. All right, there's a motion and second to approve the subordination agreement. Any questions, any comments to the motion? Please cue it. Please enter your votes. And Mr. Mayor, I, I will Passed say that um, they are going to um, put lighting on fields six through eight uh, at South Commons. There must go lighting, and um, and just for clarification, the subordination agreement because it's financed by uh, the Sports Council, uh, must go lighting would have. Uh, first rights if Sports Council fails to pay to claim the lights, and then, of course, we would have second position, but we know that that's not going to happen. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I've got. We will approve item A through G and read them out one by one. All right, we've got a motion to approve the purchases A through G. We have a second. Would anybody like any of these pulled for discussion? All right, we'll, uh, we'll call for the vote after the city yes. manager reads through them. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got flatbed uh, dump trucks. There are three of them that we're asking your approval. We've got a contract amendment uh, for a public transit needs assessment. We, you know, we told you we were going to come back annually after um, looking at routes to make sure they're most efficient with the $22.4 million um, teach loss money. And... Um, got Adobe licensing, subscription renewal fee, uh, task order two for engineering services for infantry road and follow me trail. Uh, that's a new infantry road. Got amendment one for architectural and engineering services for Mott's Green. Um, got radio installation services for Metro buses, workers compensation excess, excess uh, coverage and loss control services. Uh, those are the purchases, Mr. Mayor. All right. We do have a motion and a second. Any discussion on any of these items? Please cue the system and please enter your votes. Purchase items A through G pass unanimously. Mr. Mayor, I've got um, three updates. The first one is a uh, monthly finance update. Um, our finance director, Angelica Alexander, is going to come. Good evening. Good evening.
Okay, so what you have before you is the monthly uh, financial snapshot as of January 2019. Um, just starting at the top right of the snapshot, um, when comparing January 2019 to January 2018, the general fund is up 3.04%. The other local option sales tax fund is up 6.32%. Stormwater sewer fund is up 1.85%. A paving fund is up 2.90%. The medical center fund is up 2.09%. The integrated waste fund is up 6.01%. The emergency telephone fund is up 10.80%. The economic development authority fund is up 2.09%. Um, debt service fund is up 7.15% and that uh, difference is due, just due to timing of some internal transfers. We transferred uh, some debt service payments, some new debt service payments to that to this fund in January that were not in place in January 2018. So that's why it's more than, uh, that's why that particular fund is up 7.15 percent. Um, transportation fund is up 2.37 percent. The trade center fund is up 6.16 percent. Um, Bull Creek Golf Course Fund is down 1.29%. The Oxbow Creek Golf Course Fund is up 9.34%. And the Civic Center Fund is down 1.72%. Moving down the snapshot to the older local option sales tax fund, um, the public safety uh, revenues are year to date about 12.9 million. Expenditures um, year to date is about 13.9 million or, or about $14 million. The other local option sales tax infrastructure revenues are about 5.5 million. And expenditures uh, to date are 8.8 .8 million. Moving to the left side of the snapshot, um, you'll see highlighted there the departments that are uh, currently on our watch list. Our remaining percentage goal for FY19 is to be above 42% um, or to have expended no more than 58%. So you'll see here highlighted is the city attorney's litigation. And again, we're defend still defending several million in claims. The uh, information technology department, um, that's just due to the timing of annual fees uh, for various software, uh, software leases and maintenance agreements. The employee benefits um, is highlighted here, but that is just due to our annual death and major disability payments. That is a once a year payment, and that is pretty much um, the bulk of the budget for this particular division. And so I don't anticipate there'll be um, any over budget issues for this uh, department. Um, real estate um, is on the watch list, and that's just due to our building maintenance and repairs. Um, currently, and um, as council approved the budget tonight, the budget amendment um, for FY19 tonight, I'll make some budget adjustments here um, for this, but this is primarily due to Legacy Terrace and some of the repairs that we've had to make at Legacy Terrace. So um, these, this, they should come off the watch list in February. So um, elections, um, the Department of Elections um, came to council uh, recently to request additional funding. Obviously, that's why they're highlighted here, and it's p particularly due to the runoff election that took place in December, uh, but council agreed to um, the uh, over budget um, appro uh, additional appropriations for elections. So. Um, they'll, may, they'll stay on the watch list just so that I can monitor the amount that was actually requested by the department just to make sure that there isn't the need for an additional request. The jury manager is listed here and again this is um, primarily due to the jury, the petit jury fees as well as the subscription services that's paid out of the um, jury manager's budget for the jury pool. And then we have the public defender uh, department here on the watch list, and that is just due to the monthly contract that we pay to the state. We pay that contract one month in advance, so they'll always, for the most part, be on our watch list, although I don't foresee any budgetary issues with public defender currently. So that, in a nutshell, is our financial snapshot for January 2019. 
and I will take any questions that council may have. We do have a question. Uh, Councillor Crabb. Can you tell me a little bit about Legacy Car Terrace? I'm not familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Legacy Terrace is a property that is owned by the city. Um, recently, there was a fire there. And so we have had to make repairs to that um, facility. I believe it was um, um, CDBG funds. No, well, I mean, Pam could provide more information, but the repairs are due to the fire that um, happened at Legacy Terrace. Would we get insurance from that fire? Not in this case. Okay. Yes, and it's managed by the Housing Authority. I see. Okay. All right. Any more questions for our finance manager? And Mr. Mayor, um, just a comment. Um, just reading from the editorial notes that uh, the finance director sent me when she sent this report to me, um, the positive note is what she sent me is that uh, general fund revenue is up 3%. Sales tax collections are up approximately 6% year to date uh, compared to last fiscal year. And, um, and then she indicated that, and I know there's been questions asked in the past about um, parking violations uh, and um, revenue from parking and I will tell you that the revenue is up in parking 32 percent um, year to date when compared to last year and and I'll tell you uh, the difference in why um, I think it's up or know that it's up um, uh, last year um, prior to this fiscal year uh, we had three full-time parking enforcement managers in parking enforcement. And um, on um, many, many days, um, we would have no employees at work. Um, on many, many days, we would have one of the three at work for various reasons. Um, I recall one day I went by and I stopped at Metro and asked about parking enforcement. Uh, I was alarmed that we didn't have any employees at work. They were all out for various reasons. And so on many days during last fiscal year and prior to last fiscal year, uh, there was really no parking enforcement going on. And, um, and so I suggested to them that we reorganize parking enforcement and we hire uh, using the same funding that it would apply to three full-time employees. We take that funding and we hire eight to 10 part-time employees and we pay them the hourly rate. And so um, we go through a system of uh, assigning three employees or however many per day. And if an employee could not come in, then you've got eight on the list. You bring in one of the other eight on the list. And on every single day, we have the appropriate number of parking enforcement officers uh, out working. And these are people that get out of the car and walk, much like you see on TV. And they're doing uh, an awesome job. And um, some people don't like it, but if you exceed the time limit, I mean, they're out there working where they may be accustomed to one enforcement officer being somewhere around in the district or none working, and you just exceed the limit. Well, you can't do that now because there's always that number working. And so I wanted to highlight that because you know, you, you saw the parking enforcement piece um, in the newspaper, and I know the media has asked questions about uh, parking enforcement. 
Well, they're out there working and they're doing their jobs. And so, but the good news is that um, parking enforcement revenue is up 32%, general fund revenue is up 3%, and sales tax collection. We've not been able to say this in pre prior years. Sales tax collection year to date is up 6%. And so thank you for the fan job that you're doing, uh, Angelica. <laughs> And so, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to share the good news. Well, we appreciate it. We want, uh, Angelica, remember that uh, when you get applauded as the messenger, sometimes you get yelled at as the <laughs> right. messenger. Right. <laughs> you do a great job. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing that about Metro. It was an innovative approach to uh, solving an issue, and it's, it's obviously paying dividends. Yes, sir. Oh, we have another uh, uh, comment. Just a moment. Uh, Councilor Woodson. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if it would go to Angelica or to the city manager, but I wanted to know. I know we talked about one time being people to be able to pay electronically. Yes. Did we ever get that up and running? Yes. I've been so blessed that I haven't had a ticket. Well, for a parking citation? Yes. 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 Any, yes. Any Currently, citation. you can't pay for a parking citation online. And okay. talk about what we're doing citywide as we're moving, what we're moving because I know we talked about it, but I didn't know it was implemented already. Yes, yes, okay. ma'am. You can currently pay for a parking citation online. And what the city manager is referring to back in December, council approved um, our banking services contract as well as our merchant services contract. And we have um, hooked up with the vendor uh, in court. They are able to, they are going to provide to us merchant services at no cost to the city. So we'll be wow. able to implement um, will have the ability to offer more credit card payment services at um, various locations. They will provide all of the hardware that we need to um, implement this service. And they also um, are able to provide web payment services. That is something that is still in a work in progress across the board. Um, but parking citations can definitely be paid online currently, as well as... Um, Speeding tickets? Citations and recorders. Well, well and, and I will say that well. um, Donna uh, Willingham started in recorders court first within court, mm -hmm. and so that kind of got us on the right track. And we were moving in that direction with new software, but we're getting there, and we're going to be across the board. Right. Okay. I was just so, wondering because I know it was something we had spoken about. So another good job, mm -hmm. job well done. City Manager, I had a question. I have requested a audit for Vol Creek. Did we ever get that audit completed? Um, What's the status of that? For Bull Creek, I mm -hmm. believe that is on the internal auditors. I think he left, uh, Mr. Mayor. Bull Creek Golf Course you're referring to. Correct. Um, I will tell you now, of course, you want something new, but years ago, a few years back, he did do one, and we've I've heard him mention an audit for Bull Creek, so I know that that's... Uh, okay. that's the only reason I had access because it was changing, right. and you I, know, management, and I wanted yeah. us to be consistent. Transition audit. Correct, mm -hmm. because every time a department leaves, we've been having them to ensure everything's in place. And I, I believe that's on, he has that on his schedule. On the schedule? Yeah. Okay, I would just wanted to see if it was still in the process of it. Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, there, there are no other questions. We're going to have Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge uh, do the transportation update that we've been trying to work in for a few weeks now. So good evening. I'm just going to talk about the transportation update and the funding. Excuse I'm sorry. Yes, just sir? before you even get started. Uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. City Manager. Yes, ma'am. When we talk about audits. Do you do audits on the bid processes? I, I didn't hear you, ma'am. Do you do audits on the bid processes? On bid process? Mm -hmm. um, I know the mayor has asked the internal auditor to just take a look at process, and I believe, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, it, at the request of some counselors, uh, we, uh, we were asked if we could get the auditor. I know Councilor House and Councilor Crabb had, had brought it up about um, just taking a look at the process, just uh, in, in kind of in the normal course of business, 
in, um, in making sure that we're, we're doing everything we need to do because I don't know that we've looked at it in a while. So, yes, ma'am. They are. They're going to look at the, uh, the process for uh, procurement. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor, we've got the transportation update. Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge. Okay, so funding for uh, transportation projects comes from various sources, uh, the other local option sales tax, infrastructure, the paving fund, uh, the transportation, special purpose local option sales tax, or the TSPLOS, um, GDOT grants, as well as LMIG, which comes from GDOT directly uh, to the city. LMIG? Local no. maintenance. Um, it's local, local maintenance, maintenance. road uh, projects. Uh, oh. LMIG. LMIG. They changed it. It used to be LARP, and now it's LMIG. But I will get you what that stands for. Uh, okay. I got it. Okay. I just want to know what it's used for. Yes. So uh, resurfacing since uh, FY15, we have expended 2.6 out of OLOST, uh, 2 million out of the paving fund, and this is specifically for resurfacing as well as 2.3 million of TSPLOS discretionary. And we currently have 3.8 mil million in a current contract. Uh, we're working on uh, Savannah Street, a complete reconstruction of Savannah at, um, I believe that's about 500,000 on Savannah, 532,000 on Savannah, as well as um, a whole list of uh, streets totaling 11 miles um, that's currently being resurfaced. Uh, that's a total of 10.7, um, approximately 62 miles uh, since FY15. <laughs> Our transportation projects uh, currently managing nine locally, uh, totaling about $40 million. Uh, three managed by GDOT, which is Talbotton Road, uh, Veterans Parkway North, and the U.S. 27 Custer Road Interchange. Uh, Veterans Parkway North is uh, finishing up, uh, thankfully, um, and Talbotton is making really good progress. We have one um, active uh, bridge project currently being managed, and we have 19 projects, estimated about $40 million, that are under development. Uh, these are our nine active projects. I gave a trail update, which we covered the Follow Me Trail, uh, Bib Mill, City Mill, uh, the Fort Benning Road Streetscapes and the MLK Trail, so I won't cover those this evening. The other projects, uh, Forest Road Phase 1 has uh, basically completed. We'll be scheduling a dedication for Mayor Pro Tem Pugh on Forest Road. <laughs> Have a big celebration for that. Um, Winton Road Streetscapes is uh, wrapping up. We should have that completed soon and we'll be scheduling a dedication uh, for that uh, project as well. Uh, the Fort Benning Road Roundabout, if you've been out to that area, you can tell it's under major construction with the realignment uh, with Brennan Road as well as um, MLK resurfacing. I think when I put this presentation together several weeks ago, the resurfacing wasn't completed, but it is completed and they'll come back um, next month with the striping as well as the River Road Bradley Park roundabout. That is definitely well under construction. This is just a, a picture of what the roundabout will look like um, when completed. Uh, I think Councillor Davis uh, keeps a, an eye on that project um, and helps us with keeping an eye on that River Road roundabout project. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, uh, Deputy City Manager. Well, hang on. Councilor House. When do you think that roundabout will be finished? Uh, we're looking at an estimated <clears throat> completion of March of 2020. March of 2020. Thank so we've got a little ways to go. Okay. But, Thank you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do some of the work, um, more work closing down the road when school's out over the summer and kind of get a head start on some of that. But we're looking at it just over another year for that. Uh, the Buena Vista Road spider web project, this is a $48 million project. It's currently under design. Uh, the right-of-way is underway, so we're making good progress on uh, the spider web project. This was a T-SPLOST project. Uh, the 185 uh, Buena Vista Road Just, interchange, which is a $40 million. Me. Excuse me, Deputy yes, Manager, uh, Councilor Huff. Thank you. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, how close are we to knowing when we will actually get started 
on the uh, spider web? On the spider web, hopefully we'll be um, bidding that out by the end of the year. Yeah, we're hoping to be out to bid by the end of the year. Okay, completion probably what, 2021? Do we know? Have they got an estimate yet? Maybe a little on the completion. Well, and while he, she's asking, it looks different out there with all the demolition going yeah. on. Yeah. They, I mean, they've yeah. they've really cleared yeah, it's out. It's coming along well. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've had. Uh, go ahead. And we're estimating about 24 months, but when we get the bids in, they'll give us a timeline for what they anticipate. Okay. But we're yeah, anticipating get, another two yeah, years. Yeah, I keep getting phone calls, and I was like the city manager. I said, just keep your eyes open. Things are happening right yeah. in front of your eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank we you. We have a couple more uh, major right-of-way acquisitions to make and finishing up the plans, but it should be uh, relatively soon by the end of the year. Are we going to be able to uh, work the trails out to tie in going up? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. So the Buena Vista I-85 interchange, this is um, under design. GDOT is working on acquiring right away at this point. It's a $40 million project, and again, that is a T-plus project. This will be a diverging diamond, which will be new to Columbus, um, but actually helps traffic flow uh, much better. Yeah, and that is, that is going to be, go back. Uh, that is going to be, yeah, quite different for Columbus. and. Uh, there's uh, one in Atlanta uh, that I'm that I'm aware of, but they're really efficient and work. But people they'll they'll have to get used to them. Councilor Thomas, um, I, there are a couple in Atlanta. Uh, I've been on several of them, uh, and the two that I like the most lead to shopping centers. Um, so you know you may want to put that in your in your plan, but it really is. Um, as you say, it, it, it alleviates so many uh, concerns mm -hmm. at um, uh, interchanges like this. It really is a, a good deal. And Pam, at some point in this, would you talk a little bit about um, the complaints that I'm sure other counselors heard also uh, when our um, citizens say, nobody's working on that road. That road is, is torn up and nobody's working on it. At some point, would you talk about that? Thank sure. you. Um, Conceda Road, I-85 Interchange, this is a $58 million project. Again, this is just a, one of the concepts. We have received approval from uh, Federal Highways for this intersection, so that is uh, one hurdle that has been accomplished, um, and they're continuing to uh, work on those uh, design plans uh, currently. Um, so we're at a total of about $226 million worth of projects um, either under design or under construction currently. So would you say that again? How many projects and how much money? We are $226 million worth of projects. We have nine projects uh, locally managed, uh, three managed by GDOT. Um, we have three t -SPLOS projects that are underway as well as one bridge project. So we're at $226 million, uh, currently in projects going on all over the city. Councilor Allen. Turn them back down, right? Turn them back down. Right? I'll just turn somebody off. Thank you, Mayor. I got panel um, turned off. I just wanted to uh, let Council know that um, we had a rather energetic meeting last night with the neighborhood out at, uh, regarding the rezoning at Salmon and 80. Uh, the only thing I want to say about it at this point is they requested to have more of a dialogue with the DOT. There are a lot of R cuts, and as you saw in this report, there's a roundabout being considered at that end, <clears throat> two roundabouts, I believe, out there. And so they requested to have a, a meeting with the uh, DOT commissioners, uh, Lynn Westmoreland and uh, Johnny Floyd. Mm -hmm. And the city manager, uh, uh, I appreciate your interjection and offering to try to facilitate a meeting with them. Sure. And so I just wanted, for those listening, I just wanted to, to mention that sure. and uh, that that is underway and we will hope to have that meeting uh, soon. Sure. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
And as uh, Councillor Allen said, there are two uh, proposed roundabouts at Beaver Run and Macon Road, as well as uh, Macon Road and Lynch Road. And these are both GDOT projects as Beaver Run Road is a GDOT route. And I'm not going to go through these individually, but this is just a list of projects uh, that are under development or, or design. Uh, the Benning Road Bridge, Reese Road Bridge at Cooper Creek, Clarendon Bridge, the Infantry Road and Trail, which we had an item on the agenda tonight, 10th Street Plaza, Mott's Green. Again, we had an item on the agenda moving these forward. Uh, Forson Road, Williams Road intersection. There'll be a roundabout at that intersection. And then we're, again, still working on the Liberty District trail connection as well as other trail connections. So I didn't specifically go through trail connections. We had a separate presentation on that. Um, so I didn't cover trails uh, this evening. And to address uh, Councillor Thomas's concern, we do hear those same complaints that they drive by and they don't feel that work's being done. And, and there is something being done. They just might not see it. Again, at the spider web, there's a lot of right-of-way acquisition going on and demolition of those facilities. So there's not actual road work. There's a lot of preliminary things that have to be accomplished before, the actual, before they'll actually see constructions. There's uh, utility coordination to relocate utilities in the area and so until construction starts there's a lot of behind the scenes uh, items that are going on and I know we received um, quite a few complaints about the Veterans Parkway uh, North project and and seemingly that it was at a standstill that was a GDOT managed project and as you know as soon as we received a complaint we would forward that to GDOT uh, for them to respond directly to those citizens um, for any complaint that they had. I know Councilor House That's gave us uh, uh, an issue that was happening with the striping where the left turn lanes were, um, I think, too close together, and so they went out immediately and, and made that correction. So, again, if citizens have questions or, or concerns, please notify us. You can contact 311, and we'll make sure that they get a response. Yes. I know, too, that um, sometimes um, there are other issues that affect the construction, the weather, um, you know, supplies, those kinds of things. And um, it's not always easy to, um, to know that there is something going on. We're waiting for the, you know, the road to dry out, if you right. will, uh, before. Um, but I guess, I guess what I want is for citizens to be reassured that those folks are not just sitting there. Uh, twiddling their thumbs. There is uh, something happening maybe behind the scenes where you can't actually see it. Um, but if they have a question, um, certainly um, 311 or... Um, or contact us directly, engineering department, planning department, or myself. We'll be happy to, if we don't know the answer, we'll be happy to get the answer for them. Perfect example on MLK is the signals. We are on back order for the black powder-coated uh, signal poles that won't be in until June. And so it looks like it's kind of an unfinished project right now, and it, and it is, but we're waiting on, on those poles so we can complete those signals at those two intersections. So citizens have questions, please feel free to call. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councillor um, Davis. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Ms. City Manager, could we have a, uh, a work session, just kind of talk about the matter, a matter pertaining to our franchise agreement? Uh, I'm getting more and more calls from citizens who are concerned about um, just the level, I guess the level of work, um, work that's incomplete, work that's Messy. left, not followed, uh, um, wires hanging, just a myriad of... Sure matters and issues pertaining to uh, pertaining to all these utility companies that that we deal with the franchise agreement um, and you know they ask what can be done um, I'd like to have that discussion in public so we can address that what can be done and how to bring it to the attention of the city and and uh, and and even what I'd like to be reminded of what these utility companies are responsible for and working in the city's right away all right, thank you. And you know, it is interesting that over the last couple of meetings, we've had some discussions about things that we don't typically talk about, like potholes, and then we talk about the pace of construction. 
I think it is important that people understand that um, the, there's there's typically a reason why we're not getting out there as timely, and there's a reason whether it's weather or it's you know temperature or the availability of the asphalt. So there's a reason why the potholes aren't fixed, and um, and I, we got we have really some some amazing employees, some terrific employees, and they're. They are uh, anxious to do their jobs, and they do them just as quickly as they're allowed based on different criteria that, uh, that they have to deal with. And Pam, great, great update. Uh, we just still have to work on teaching you how to mispronounce Buena. It's, and, it's uh, Buena, Dan. And, and, and Mr. Mayor, I, I wanted, um, wanted Deputy City Manager Hodge to just kind of repeat um, the dollar value and and the work that's going on related to roads uh, throughout our city and and as she was talking and and i was thinking uh, if you think about it um, i mean we've got work um, going on with roads all over town north south east and west i um, mean she just shared with you the, the money the amount of money that's going to be spent on I-185 around Buena Vista Road and then an interchange at Casita Road. We've got work going on on Winton Road, the streetscapes. We've, we've got uh, work at Veterans and Fortson Road and Williams Road and Moon Road and River Road um, Roundabout. Uh, we, we talked about Forest Road tonight. We've got uh, streetscapes going on at Fort Benning Road and streetscapes on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and we got Tarverton Road and we got Reese Road work and you know and, and and the list goes on and on and on and I say that so that people will hear this but north, south, east, west I mean we've got road projects, road work going on uh, to improve our transportation system all over the city and 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 no one can say that there's nothing going on in South Columbus and it's all going on in North Columbus. You just heard millions and millions of dollars that's being spent on the south side of town. But it's not just there, but it's, you know, it's, it's just all over town. And I just wanted to pause to just remind us, because, you know, we don't think about it and we're not everywhere, but to remind those here and watching by television how much road work we go have going on all over the city. I just wanted to say that. Yes, sir. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Thomas? Uh, I also wanted to um, remind Council, when we, when we started talking about the OLOS and the infrastructure, roads and infrastructure for OLOS, one of the, the things that was brought to um, our attention was we have about 1,000 miles of road in Muskogee County. And we ought to be doing, you know, so many miles a year to resurface to keep that um, updated. Our concern is, our problem is, that we don't have the money to do that um, as quickly sometimes as it should be done. But what we do have are people who are more than willing to go out and take a look and see, does this road need to be moved up the list or, or whatever. But if money were no object, uh, we'd be doing about 100 miles of road a, a year, uh, but money is an object, and so we can't do that kind of, of but, but don't I remember about 1,000 miles in Muskogee County of paved road? Yeah. Seems Somewhere like, around 1,200. About 1,200. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one of the, the issues is that we have that much road space sure. that we have to deal with, but... Um, this this is an excellent report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor um, Pugh. I want to say um, thank you to the citizens of Columbus for voting on that tax, transportation tax, because there were so many cities that they did not vote for, it and they're hurting. Yeah. Absolutely. And, at the time, the mayor was a councilor. He was on that committee, and I want to say thank you to you also. Yes, ma'am. Well, the citizens did it. The citizens are the ones that uh, made a decision. They wanted their roadways improved, and they approved the projects, and they're the ones that, that got all that done. So, yes. Uh, thank look, you. I, 
I, I'm trying to remember if they said that we're not going to be able to do it again. Uh, this, runs out. this one does sunset, and I think at that point, all of the all of the uh, regions that that voted on it will have a, a chance to revisit it at that time. So, uh, yeah, the T splost. I think it's in 23. 20, 22. 22. It expires in 22. So yeah, it'll be coming up in about another three years, I guess. So we'll have a chance to revisit it. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. City Manager. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, final update will be a census update. Uh, Director Rick Jones. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Let me take a point of personal privilege to remind you of something else before I get started with this. This Thursday night at 530 uh, at the Government Center Annex at 420 10th Street, uh, we will be holding the public hearing that Council Woodson asked considering about uh, amending the UDO to allow special exception uses in the historic district for uh, health facilities and, to, and the like. We will have that meeting, and of course, I want to make sure the viewing public are aware and reminded of that fact as well. Uh, so that is this coming Thursday at 530 at the uh, Government Center Annex. I've been asked to come tonight and share with you again an update about the 2020 census. Um, I have a short presentation. It, it got shorter, though, when the mayor stole all my thunder a while ago <laughs> Sorry. About, about the census. So I apologize. I, I'm, I'll I'm, do better. That's all right. I, I'm, I'm going to reemphasize what you've already said. Oh, please sir. do. You, I'm I'll straighten it out if I said it wrong. Uh, we had proposed to give this to you back in January. We just were not able to do that. This is what you really need to know about the census tonight and where, and where we're going with it more than anything else. First and foremost, it is in the Constitution. It requires that every, uh, the census requires every 10 years, everybody gets counted. So that that's, that's the reason we're doing it. We do it every 10 years. We did it in 2010. Now we're getting ready to get to do it in 2020. And we say here the first census was back in 1790. Everyone really counts. This is important also involved with that. The census counts every living person in the U.S. And I, and I failed to start off this thing properly because I want to say this to you as well. Uh, every department head, every governmental entity, organization, whatever, comes up here and stands before you and says, this is the most important thing you need to hear. I do that on times. But you need to understand, I'm not speaking just for the Department of, of Planning tonight. I'm talking about for the citizens of Columbus how important this really is to us. And I want to go a little bit deeper into this. This idea, though, that everyone really counts. We have to count everybody. And we want to give you an idea of why that's important. It's about fair representation to make sure that not only you on council are, are representing the folks you should be representing, but on our, on our state legislature and, and Congress, even at the president, we need to make sure we have that proper representation counted. Uh, it's about redistricting, and that should perk your ears up. Uh, Councilor Barnes will remember this, and we did this the last time. Uh, we, and we had Councilor Baker, and it's now Councilor Crabb's district. We had some changes in those boundaries, and we had to go back through and through, do, the, do the redistricting. We'll do that again in 2021, 2022. That's important to you because, again, your, the number of folks that live in your district may change. And we need to make sure we get an accurate count of those po folks in each district we've got. And last but not least, it's, it's all about money, really, when it gets right down to it. Uh, it means about $675 billion that will be collected and dispersed over the next 10 years once everything's really said uh, and done from that. It's really vital term in terms of what the programs we run now. Uh, so it, does it really make any difference for how we count folks and how it goes about? Well, let me just give you two quick examples here. This is out of this thing called homes.com, and they show Columbus as of basically 2018 as the number two largest city in, in, the, uh, in the state. That's an estimate. That's not an actual real count. Now, you understand that. If you go to somebody else's site, though, you go to this one by Georgia Demographics, they have it listed third behind Augusta, pretty much with basically the same kind of number, but we're still third. It's, in this case, it's really more about bragging rights than anything else. But it also is important in terms of how we're we get. We're really number one. We're really number one. Yeah, we're <laughs> bigger than Atlanta. <clears throat> it really, it really does matter, matter to us though about in terms of how we get counted and what the actual real number is. Let me show you what I'm talking about even more. So, this is 2018 data from the Census Bureau itself. You'll see at the top line, or the, the second line there, that they are, they're estimating us to be actually at 194,058. Uh, that that 
goes against what where they did based the count in April of April of 2010, which was 190,000, and then the census, you know, population census and so forth, and again at 189. This is important because again, a lot of the revenue we're going, we're going to receive from grants and other programs are going to be based off these numbers. A lot of the the apportionment of fundings we get we involved with that. In turn. Organizations like ESRI, which is really a, a, a GIS-based operation that we, we utilize now for a lot of the things we do, uh, and a lot of businesses also utilize this thing and, and so forth. What ESRI tells us really is the population for them was for us in, in, 20, in 2000 was 186,291. Uh, by 2010, it went to 189,885. And then uh, in 2018, it's showing us at 193,432, which is a little bit different. And then the, the actual population though in 2023, what they're projecting right now, based off the 2010 numbers, shows us actually losing population. That ought to be a concern to us, and it should be, and it is. Uh, because that's what we're, we're, we're when somebody's coming to a community of this size, they're looking and saying, well, what's going on with it? Why are they, you know, are they, are they gaining population? Are they losing population? And if they're losing population, population, why? What's going on there that's really got a negative effect on them? That's the importance to do it. You can also see here what they, they show in terms of annual rate. They're not showing a whole lot of growth rate. Um, 2018 to 2023 is really the, that's where they're showing we're actually losing that population. And that is concerning to us. Quick question. It was yes, sir. being asked by um, Councilor Woodson. This is just Muskogee County? Yes, So sir. it doesn't take into account Fort Benning population in Chattahoochee? My, my presentation is just focused on, on Muskogee County Thank and Columbus. You. Now, that we, could, we could go back and show you that some of the surrounding areas and how they're actually gaining population. But for tonight's purposes, this is what we're talking yes. about with Muskogee County on. And, and so... I didn't it, answer it right. I'm sorry. Councilor, I'm sorry. Councilor. No, um, Rick, the reason I was asking the mayor to check with you is because you know you have a lot of military that live off, off post, you know, live in our community. That's why I was asking then they would be considered Muskogee County since they yes, live in they're, 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 it. Since the they are. live in our community, then they would be. So it's important to market those military families then, it, it wouldn't it be? Um, when you said that, though, the story that comes to mind about it is it's not, not, nothing against Chattahoochee County, but you look at what they one day and they have a growth rate of 20, 22 percent. And then you go back another year or two later on and they have a drop of 20, 22 percent. And what's happening is the military is moving in and out of, that, of, the, of Chattahoochee County. They're either being deployed somewhere else or, or whatever the case may be. And that kind of gives you a, a really a skewed re results in terms of what we're looking at. But for Muskogee County, my understanding is they are counted as part of the, the, part of the population okay. in, in Muskogee County. So it's really important to encourage then the military yes, families that live off post. Right. Okay. This, Thank this, you. This, this, uh, this graphic I want to show you just just give you an idea of what we actually do with the data we, we, we get. This again is a, is, a, is a thing that we generate off of ESRI itself in terms of showing the, the, the variation of age and then with an age pyramid in terms of show you where our age groupings really lie. That's important to us from a planning aspect because if we said during the comprehensive plan sessions, it doesn't make any sense for us to go out there and build a lot of ball fields if our population is already older and graying and they're never going to use ball fields to begin with. And by the same token, if our population is really young and we, go, we see a, a real influx, we need to be building those kind of facilities to take care of that, that population grouping. Uh, but we also can use it in terms of dealing with that, in terms of household size, who we're actually serving in the community itself, typically at budget time. Uh, talk about education levels, that's always, always in the news for some, for some degree about what, how we're improving or not improving. Again, businesses look for this in terms of do you have an educated workforce? And these kind of statistics are the first thing they look for before they'll come to your community. So just to give you an idea, this is what we're capable of producing now, and hopefully the numbers come back in, we'll, we'll look at it. There are some milestones you need to know about real quick here, and wrapping this up for you. Um, in 2019, the partnership activities are launched in terms of getting things to get started and so forth. I should say at this point right now, the census itself really has already started. I mean, the actual county. If you live in Alaska today, they are actually got their counting. And I got, I got to thinking about that. I mean, it's cold in Alaska last time I looked. And it's freezing cold. And why are they counting now? It's because a lot of the villages, they cannot reach during the summer or cannot reach as easily during the summer. And it's easier to walk across the ice 
and get to the village or get to that area using you, you a, a sled team or whatever. But they're actually out there counting now, which I thought that was fascinating. So the, the census is on already started. Complete counts committee has to be established. As the mayor's already said to you tonight on uh, on the six, we'll be having that meeting over there in at the, at the library across the street here to help establish that committee and get that committee going. We've already sent out the invitations to, to everyone to invite them to come and, and sit with us in, in during that meeting. Uh, we're we're here to basically serve the mayor's office in, in terms of helping that that process out and make sure it gets going. But on March 6, we're we're starting that that program off from that. Uh, the area census office will open sometime this year as well, probably I would think mid-summer time. I haven't don't have had that information directly in hand. The advertising itself for the census will begin, as I we're told now, early 2020, maybe get started even before that, uh, just to let folks get, get the understanding that um, the census is get, you know, getting to, uh, to get, get ready to get kicked off and so forth. This is also that you understand too. This is the first census that will. But my understanding is you will be actually allowed to fill out the forms online. They will not be sending it necessarily unless you ask for it, a paper copy. But they will be they will be sending out the forms online for you to fill out and return back. Um, this is when that public response will begin in 2020, either online or by phone or mail itself. Uh, from that standpoint, and then census day is actually April 1st of next year. I don't know why they picked April Fool's Day, but that's not, that's not my concern. <laughs> I'm just telling you that you, you need to circle that on your calendar. And the whole, the whole point of me coming tonight is for you to get excited about the idea and understand the importance about this so that you'll share it with, with your constituents and anybody <coughs> you talk about that the census is coming and it is important. Uh, the in-person visits will follow up to that for ones that either don't fill out the forms or need more information from that. Uh, apportionment accounts are then sent back, sent to uh, the president by the end of 2020. So that all those numbers are pretty much set in, set in stone. And then in 2021, the redistricting actually starts. And that's important because, like I said, it may, have, it may and probably will affect the districts we have uh, in, in, the, in the community as a whole now uh, from that standpoint. This gives you an idea just the organizational chart in terms of who's, who's responsible in dealing with the census. Uh, Ms. Strode was here a few weeks back to you uh, give you her update and let her know her, her input and she'll be working uh, the, the uh, meeting next, next Wednesday uh, from that. Here's the role of Columbus real quick. Uh, we have to make sure we have an accurate census count. If we under, get, under count it, it means we're going to get, we're going to lose some additional funding somewhere along the line. So it's important. Uh, according to the ACCG website, the 2010 census brought in approximately $1,339 per person uh, per year in state funding. So whatever, fund, whatever <coughs> funds we send, whatever funds you send and I send back in paying taxes, we want to make sure and get them back. But on average, we got about $1,300 back uh, from that because of that. Failure to count, uh, to count 10, holes contain, 10 households rather containing 2.5 people could result in the loss of almost $335,000 to this community. That is, that's an estimate we got from ACCG. That's important. That's money that we could be utilizing for roads and other projects in, in this community. And it's, it's vital that we have that, that count. Um, we gotta make, we've already made sure that the, uh, this thing called local update census address to Luca has been completed. We did that last year. They're going to send it back to us. Uh, basically, we, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. It, it basically allows, requires us to make sure we check all local, local resident addresses. We've done that. Uh, we're going to get another chance, another another bite at the apple this summer to go in there and look at and make sure everything is, is, is fully what we said it should be before they send it off and start doing their work. We're glad we got to establish a local uh, count, local complete count committee. Again, we'll do that next week, uh, which provides those educational tools and how we get this thing going. Uh, we want to be able to motivate citizens as best we can to, uh, to encourage folks to do that. And of course, this, the stakeholders for this, this complete count committee includes not only city leaders, but schools and colleges, uh, regional commission, the media, and so forth on here. We're trying to involve everybody we possibly can to make that work. So our next step's really here. Uh, we've got to work with that, that complete counts committee and make sure it's, it's functional and make sure it's on target. Uh, they, both GMA and ACCG have been offering workshops around the state. We have attended those. Not all of them, but we have 10 of those to make sure that we have an understanding about what they're trying to deal with in complete counts. And 
Last, of course, not least, the most the thing I keep emphasizing here tonight to you is we got to make sure that every one of our citizens is counted. Uh, just for the fact of making sure that they have equal and fair representation and that we receive basically the funding that we, should be, we think we justly deserve over the next 10 years. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I will stop and I'll try to answer any questions if there are any. Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Jones, what's the date on, on, on those public meetings again? Dates of public meetings. Public so meetings? Dates of public meetings. Uh, the public meeting for the complete count is, there's not really a public meeting, it's just a, the meeting of establishing the, the committee itself. There, okay. we, have no, we don't have any meeting scheduled that I know of for the public hearing or anything else. Our objective is just to make sure we get the word out. It's important. But I think people can attend on the 6th. Yes, sir, they if, can. If they want to sit and listen to, to some they're, of the information. They're, they're certainly welcome to come. They want to, because eventually we are going to need volunteers. I know the, the committee is going to need volunteers to help get the word out. Uh, and it's particularly important. Again, we have anybody and everybody who really wants to work and come to that meeting. I also think that this would be one of those times when you want to have a big pep rally. Some of the high school bands. Right. I, I think you're right in terms of making sure we help help get that word out. Yes, mm -hmm. ma'am. Great idea. Councillor Woodson? Yes. Rick, um, I'm not sure if it's you or the mayor's office or whoever. Um, can you send us a, well, this is what I was telling the mayor, that, you know, the festival is September 21st, the Tri-City Latino Festival. We get about 10,000 people that come through there. And um, it's not only Latinos, it's really a multicultural festival. We just call it a Latino festival. Um, I'm pretty sure that the board would not have a problem with providing a space for someone to come out there, mend it, and, and educate people um, in reference to the censor. I think that would be a good way of doing it because you would get all, you know, everyone from Columbus that goes to the festival to see it and we can help promote it since it's very important to get our numbers higher. So I offer that to you. I just need to know if, you know, if y'all talk about it and you accept it, I need to know so I can take it back to the board and say, we need to find a good location to put, you know, the 2020 sensor so that communication can be there. I would ask, and I just say because we get, uh, variety, it's very diverse. I would ask that if there are any materials you can get from another community or something that's in Spanish or German or Asian or, you know, in other languages, um, or maybe those beautiful posters you make with quick captures of the importance of it and why you're important um, can be displayed um, where people can see it and. Uh, if you just contact me once you all decide, then I will take it back to our board and see what we can do to help with it. Yes, ma'am. Not, not to uh, wade, into, wade into controversy, but we need to make sure that there, we try to, to eliminate the fear factor that some folks have when filling mm -hmm. out forms of this type. Uh, and I think that's one of the, one, one has to be one of the goals of the, of the yeah. complete count committee is how we, how we go to, to minorities and others and say, this is nothing that we're using against you. It's done to help it, to actually help you in the long run. And I think, uh, and, and when I was sitting here thinking, you know, how can I promote this? Um, and I was sending a text to my board already, you know, telling them. What I'm thinking is the censors bring money, you know, to the community. The censors is to help your family in housing, school, roads, the importance of the quality of life. I think when you say it that way, people look at it, you know, differently. Um, when it has so much to, to go over, people fear it. Um, I think if we just say, you know, the sensor is a value of life or something like that, something catchy where it would catch your attention, the sensor just brings money to the community to fulfill your, you know, your family wishes or dreams. Right now I can't think of something real catchy but just throwing some ideas to you because I was sitting here thinking, hmm, what's a good way to promote this? Well, it's bringing funding. Why? We need roads, our school, public safety. You know, and I started listing a, a reasons why this sensor will be important. And if we can do that, 
I think that will make people be a little bit more open um, to say to to fill it out. And I think that's how I would feel more comfortable selling it, you know, to people I know by saying the sensor brings money into our community. You had a great one here um, that showed it, um, and I thought that was great. That shows that. That's the perfect way to say. You know, you filling out the sensors help us do this. And then people won't look at it as being threatening because they're looking at it their quality of life. But just food for thought, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm like 99.9 percent. .9 they'll do what I say. <laughs> so you just let me know if you're interested, and then we'll try to make Thank to you. put you in a good spot where the traffic is coming in and people will see you immediately. Right. Thank you. Good deal. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Councilor Thomas. Um, to add to that, uh, Mr. Jones, um, I'm sure that between now and April the 1st of 2020, there'll be a lot of those kinds of activities um, that um, the committee could take advantage of. And one of the things that came immediately to my mind, because I have served as the program chair for organizations, uh, organizations like Rotary and Kiwanis and some of those that have regular meetings, uh, a program uh, of this uh, type would be great. And even um, some of our churches, you know, we have Wednesday night supper at our church mm -hmm. and we have a program. And this would be a good program for some of those kinds of things so that if the committee made it real um, uh, clear to the community, if you would like to have a presentation Here's who you call and how you get on that list. Um, and, you know, a, a 15 minutes, 20 minutes is, is all you need to help bring the importance of, of what we're doing. So I would hope that, and Ms. Strode probably has already got this uh, planned and, and in the works, but I would hope that we get those kinds of things going uh, so that um, we can get into the community and, and let them know what why it is so important. I happened to work um, the 1980 census. Uh, I was the office manager for the 1980 census, and our office was down in the old uh, Morrison's cafeteria building down on 11th Street, and we had cardboard desks because we weren't going to be there very long. <laughs> uh, but it is, it is one of those things that the people who are involved in it, the staff who are involved in it, are very conscientious about um, making sure that everybody is counted. And that's um, one of the things that we want to get to the community, how important it is, how extremely important it is that everybody is counted. And it's not just a good, nice slogan that somebody thought up. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And Director Jones, I just want to say thanks, because, I mean, this is in addition to your duties, uh, which are not small amount of duties. Uh, so thank you for what you and your staff do in taking this on to try to make sure that we that we do count everybody yeah. so that we can get everything to us. Thank uh, you. So thank you. Uh, and so, Mr. Mayor, I, uh, I would just uh, say to those listening, um, you know, if you think the census count, a complete count, is not important and you would like to remain the second largest city, when you look at the numbers, the population of Augusta and Columbus, I mean, we're talking uh, 2,000 people difference, 2,000. And so if we let Augusta outwork us, you know, it could be that they're the second largest city by 300 people. I mean, we can do this, but you see the numbers, 2,000 people, I know that there were more than 2,000 people that did not get counted. And so we've got to do a good job. With that, Mr. Mayor, that concludes uh, my agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've got a couple of other councilors queued up, several actually. Councilor Huff. Did I not get you? Somebody turn it off. Hang on. <laughs> I'm coming back to you. There we go. Whoa, uh, there you go. Bruce? But uh, check into the old Casita Road area with the trailers. 
we're trying to figure out what's going on. It's horrible looking out there. I don't know if someone's taking the material for scrap or something and just leaving it with all the insulation and everything, but it's really a mess out there. So it looks as if whoever the property owner is, uh, they need to get those removed or something just to clear that area out. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Well, I, in fact, we were working on it, and I had a conversation with the mayor just this morning about not just one, but I think it was five different ones, Mayor, yeah. that we had the conversation this morning. And so we are aware of them, and we're yeah. working on the like plan. like right there on the road and yeah. just stripped down? Well, we're uh, working on a plan um, to deal with them. Okay. And also, if you would, I have someone to look into the uh, Brown Avenue Bridge area over on Liberty Avenue there uh, by uh, Elizabeth County there as you go under the bridge. Uh, the grass needs cutting now, and also if they would check into the black petition that they had alongside the back of the houses, uh, it's gone for some reason because it, that will stop all the water and runoff that runs down the hill into their yards. When it rains, all the mud goes into their walking space. Okay. And also I heard today that they are starting to uh, have some paint on our Nice looking bridge out there, so if you check into yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. City Manager. Actually, this is for the planning department probably. Uh, the, the next time you come back with the uh, government center update, such as with the analysis of the public meetings that we have, could somebody come in with, and you know, we talk about you know, the, what the different options are, but what is the square footage of office space that all of the judicial functions currently occupy in the government center, the sheriff, the marshal, all the different courts, just a, just a, 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 the gross number, just trying to get kind of a data point. And then by the same token, what's the square footage left that the city admin spaces are in the tower? And then what's the square footage of the city admin spaces in the annex building? Just trying to get an idea of you know, how, how big are these buildings gonna be when we do get around to making a decision. I sure. realize it may change based on whatever that, those designs are, but. Sure. Have some idea. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Councillor Barnes. Mr. City Manager, about a month ago, I learned something. Um, Tiasha and Val enlightened me. And, and this is a, I, I know there are a lot of other citizens that may not know this, but anyone who's on injectable, injectable medications or diabetic, that they could turn call 311 and have their shops container picked up. I didn't know that. But, but that's, that's a boom, see? And that is a boom for many individuals who may have ambulation problems or transportation problems who are on injectable medications yeah. or many diabetics. And so that's huge. And there is a really, and that's Tiasha, give her a hand, Tiasha and Val. <laughs> Because that, because that is huge. That is something I didn't know, and yeah. I definitely want to get out sure. to uh, our many citizens. And there's a really nice gentleman. His name is Troy Vanerson. I believe I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And he calls to follow up to make sure, and it's so easy. The only thing you have to do is call the 311 number prior to your pickup day, and you just take it and you put it on your front step. And he will call to ensure, and he will make sure. sure. That's huge. Oh, yeah. And I just wanted to, 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 to get that up because I didn't know it. I just heard Mimi say she didn't know it. But it's huge for a lot of um, individuals who are on injectables and or who have to test <coughs> their, their blood sugars or whatever. Yep. Sure. So I just wanted to say and give props to, 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 to Val and to, to Astiasha and that gentleman, Troy Vanderson. Yeah. Right. And uh, Council Barnes, I will say I want to, I'm not going to steal the, the mayor's thunder, but he is doing something to further promote 311. So you'll you'll see that. Oh, I think in, that's in great. Coming then. Days. They work hard. They deserve yeah. it. That's yeah. good. They do. We are uh, we're we're coming up with a different way to try to get um, it in front of the people of this community about what they can, what kind of information they can gain, sure. and what kind of activities they can accomplish by calling 311. Because so I tell you, that was huge. I mean, that's huge for the community. But, and I think that's the thing. I, I mean, there's stuff that we do that I, I, I'm still learning. Right. And, right. and uh, so the idea of, of 
that, that our citizens just know inherently know all the stuff we do. I think sure. it's it's great. And Tiasha and the folks at three one one, they do a great job on the intake. Thank you. All right. Uh, that concludes my agenda, Mr. All right. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. We'll uh, move on to the uh, clerk, Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. For the clerk's agenda, items one and two, these are resolutions with respect to the recommendations from the Board of Honor. The first is an honorary designation to name the community room in the Public Safety Building in honor of Master Sergeant Retired Milton Davy Lockett, Jr. Do we need a pool? Yes. 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 All right. We've got uh, a motion and a second. Uh, I'm sorry, was that Council Wilson made the second? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? For number one. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, can we cue that, Bruce? Or uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. To the motion. I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Thomas. I apologize. No, Miss Davis. Do you know? Um, I'm sorry that I don't know Master Sergeant Lockett. Um, do you know um, anything? Mm -hmm. he, he was he was one of the key focal point of the um, drug fighters. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, ah, ah. That's it's coming back to me. It's coming that, back. That one, by the way. Not, not only that, was he he's one, he helped to organize the drug fighters. But I'll just think for a minute. The first African American mm -hmm. to be voted into the Ranger Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And when he got sick, he had a number of generals who came through, who he taught at the Ranger School. So just that one, not to talk about the fact he's a judge, uh, drug fighter, not the fact that he got with, with the chiefs of police to have an annual, bring all the, the uh, uh, neighborhoods together. He did so much, but just that one, just that one, the first African American in the Ranger Hall of Fame? That's enough. I, well, I'm glad I asked. I would hate for us <laughs> no, to sort of I'm overlook glad. this without and, and I'm some. Glad, and I'm glad <coughs> you did, because he was the type of person that just stepped back, didn't look for anything, but he just did so much in, in the Columbus community. He's a, one of the unsung uh, heroes, really. Thank you. Uh, Councillor House? I want to talk about number two. Okay. All right. We, we'll just leave you. Straight we have a motion vote, second. Yes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries. Item number two, this is a resolution for honorary designation on existing street, 10th Street, from Veterans Parkway to Bay Avenue for signage to reflect Avenue of the Arts. Uh, I did just want to make a comment, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Board of Honor approved this application as submitted, and this excludes the amendment that was made and approved by the Council on February 12th. Councilor House. And I'd like to reintroduce that amendment. I think it's important to include the Liberty Theater District um, area in, mm -hmm. in this, yes. this proposal. Yes. I think just all we, I guess all we need is just a, re, a, a vote to send it back to the Board of Honor and ask them to reconsider. Yes. No. I think we just approve the, the amendment. We just approve it? Yeah, you we can, can vote You can vote to amend it, modify it, expand it, expand it. Okay. okay so All right. Well, so there's a motion on the floor to okay. extend. To amend the proposal. That's right. There we go. Oh, Councillor Huff. Yeah, it was brought to my attention last week that some of the ones involved in the Liberty District boards and things would like a little time to discuss this with you and everybody before it goes back. Well, we can make because that request no here ourselves. We can do it. We don't need well, to send it back to the board. No, but I, I, now. I think the point is that some they of the residents have, of the, and oh. property owners within the Liberty would like to yeah. not rush to this amendment, but right. to hold it uh, okay. until they can I comment. Know. Know. So there is, you want to withdraw your motion? I can withdraw that and we can put it on hold, oh. sure. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You could delay me. You make a motion. All right. So you can, they're going to call a meeting and want to make it. Is there a motion to delay it? So, I'll so make a motion to delay it until we have the discussion with the Liberty All right, it's a motion second to delay uh, the action on the recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any discussion? 
All right. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? No. All right. Item number three, this is a letter of resignation from Mr. John Allen from the Greater Columbus Golf Authority. Okay, needs to be received. It's a motion second to uh, accept with regret. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Second. Motion second, minutes be received. Any comments or any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? It passes. Item number five, these are board appointments. The first are mayor's appointments that are ready to be confirmed for Circle and the Community Development Advisory Council. We can take one motion. Motion second to confirm. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Passes. Item number six, these are council's appointments that are ready for confirmation on the Civic Center Advisory Board and the Valley Partnership Joint Development Authority. We can take one motion. Pennington, Garrett, Brandon, Jones, and Gavin. Second. Motion second to accept the, uh, to, to confirm the slate of offers there. Uh, any uh, discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? It passes. Item number seven, these are council district seat appointments. Any nominations that are made this evening may be confirmed. Yeah. We have Mr. Stan Stovall. He is interested in serving another term. Mayor Pro Tem, this is your nomination. We, Do you, you want to confirm him? Mr. Stan Stovall? He's interested in serving another term. On the Civic, Civic Center, Center Advisory. Advisory. May motion second. All right, it's motion second to confirm, Mr. Stovall. Any uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? He is confirmed. Councilor Huff. Oh, I'm waiting. Okay. For B. I'm gonna leave you on. Okay. <laughs> okay. We also have Nicole Adderley. This is Council District Move Seven. Confirmation. Second. All right. So we are replacing Miss. Adderley and She's interested in serving another term, okay. and Council Mo Woodson is renominating her deal. to serve. Sorry. Motion yeah. second to confirm. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? She's confirmed. We would also need a replacement for Mr. Alton Russell. This is the Council District <coughs> 2 representative for the Community Development Advisory Council. Uh, Councilor oh. Huff is. Go ahead. I'm sorry nominating Virginia Dickerson to replace Renee Hall, and she may be confirmed. Move confirmation. Motion second to confirm. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? She's confirmed. We have one other vacant seat. This is Council District 6 nominee. For the Recreation Advisory Board, we have a vacant seat. This is the Council District 6 nomination. We have council appointments uh, that come from the organizations and agencies. Move approval of uh, Kathy, Kathy Williams. Williams. Did you want to include also Mr. William Bray? Sure. Second. Motion and second to confirm Ms. Williams and Mr. Bray. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. They are confirmed. Item number nine. These are council appointments. Any nominations? would be listed for the next meeting. Uh, for the Building Authority, Leela Carr is interested in serving another term if a member of council Go wants to renominate her. Okay. Does Vincent want to be in it? Yes, oh, Councilor yeah. Woodson. Thank you. You're welcome. Then we have Circle, Mr. John Jackson. He is interested in serving another term if a member of council <coughs> wants to renominate him. I'll renominate is um, Eric Carter also and, in? And no, Ms. Earl is not interested in serving another Eric, term. Buckner. Butler. 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 Yeah, B-E-T-L-E-R, Okay. We will bring this back for confirmation at the next meeting for the Animal Control Advisory Board. 
We have um, an open nomination, council open Council nomination. Davis has a, has a nominee. We, does anyone have a nominee? Councilor, Councilor Davis, Davis does. And we will bring this back for the next meeting for the Board of Zoning Appeals. We will bring this back for confirmation at the next meeting. The Personnel Review Board. We will bring this back as well for the next meeting. For the Planning Advisory Commission, Councilor Garrett is nominating Larry Derby to replace Kathleen Mason. And we will bring this back for the next meeting. And we have two other seats that are open for nomination on this board. Okay. We, we can go ahead and make the nomination, and we'll still touch back basis with Mr. King just to make sure he's interested in serving. Councilor Allen. Thank you. Right. And that's all we have, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, any further questions or comments from the council? Motion to adjourn. Motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. All opposed? We are adjourned.